The number one preventable cause of death in traumatic injuries is through massive hemorrhage. If someone loses too much blood, even if the casualty makes it to a trauma center, they may still not survive those wounds because the body has lost its ability to compensate and the organs start failing and lots of other things have a cascading effect. The number one thing that you can do as a civilian is to understand the tenets of stop the bleed so that you can appropriately apply pressure, a tourniquet, or wound packing to stop or slow down the massive blood loss until first responders arrive. And since May is Stop the Bleed Month, what better time to discuss how to apply those principles to save a life? All right, let's get into it. So job number one, before we even get into the ABCs of hemorrhage control, is to ensure that the scene is safe. If there's any ongoing hazard, then we're going to deal with that hazard first. You don't want to become a casualty while you're attempting to render aid. And likewise, part of that is a long-term mitigation strategy and ensuring that you put on some type of body substance isolation gear. That's a fancy way of saying rubber gloves especially if that casualty is an unknown person to you. And even more importantly is if by observation, it appears they may have an at-risk lifestyle, such as it appears that they may be an IV drug user. The gloves that you're putting on is to protect you from bloodborne pathogens so you don't get HIV or hepatitis or any other disease that's transmitted through contact with blood. If you have safety glasses, then go ahead and throw those on as well because we don't want to get the casualty's blood inside the membranes of the eye because it could also absorb that way. Now that that is out of the way, we're gonna discuss the ABCs according to the Stop the Bleed Coalition. The A stands for alert. We want to call 911 and get those first responders en route. The shorter the timeline is from point of injury to definitive surgical care, the greater the likelihood that that casualty will survive. And that is the importance of calling 911 immediately. Here's the deal. You don't have to be the one who makes that phone call. So we have a couple of scenarios or branch plans, if you will, regarding communications with 911. If you are the only coherent person on scene, then of course it's going to be you who pulls out your phone, dials 911, and puts it on speaker. While you're preparing your gear or beginning to render aid, you're going to set that phone down so that you can still communicate effectively with the 911 operator, but preferably in a location where it's not going to get crushed accidentally because if the phone is broken, then you have a break in the combo link with first responders. The other option would be if there are other people around, then you pull somebody in and have them dial 911. Keep in mind, we need a directive task as opposed to a passive request. Instead of saying, somebody call 911, it needs to be you. Come here, dial 911, get them on the phone, put them on speaker, something of that nature. If we throw it out there to the masses of, hey, somebody call 911, it's less likely somebody is actually going to pony up and do it. Some of the key elements of information that need to be conveyed to that 911 operator is where are you located? Give them the address, but also be very specific so they don't waste time searching around to figure out where you and the casualty are at. Be very specific, especially if it's a very large scene that they're responding to. Let them know what your name is and a callback number. Those three things there should be transmitted rickety tick and as concisely as possible. The next thing we want to convey to the operator is the number of casualties that you have right there with you and the nature or mechanism of injury. So if we're talking about mechanism of injury, I have three people with gunshot wounds. Gunshot wound would be the mechanism of injury. But if, however, the scene that you're at is not a gunshot wound, but say it's a car accident, then I have three casualties that were injured in a motor vehicle collision. One had the airbag go off and punch them in the face. One wasn't wearing a seatbelt and was thrown through the windshield. And another, their arm went out the window and has severe lacerations. 
So this is the mechanism of injury and then a drill down a bit of what the actual injury is. So the A stood for alert authorities. We want to get first responders inbound to the scene we're at. The B in the ABCs stands for identify major sources of bleeding. So what does massive hemorrhage look like? Well, of course, if we see any wounds that are actively spurting blood from them, that's something that's going to get our attention and we need to address immediately. Other indicators of massive hemorrhage could be blood-soaked clothing, especially if it's a wound that is still bleeding and it's beginning to puddle up around the casualty. Any wounds that will not stop bleeding, if you have a casualty that has suffered blood loss and they have an altered mental state, meaning they're getting a little lethargic or confused or they've already lost consciousness. And then of course, if there's anybody that has suffered a traumatic amputation of an extremity, if there is a limb that part of it is missing, we want to immediately put a tourniquet on that wound. Keep in mind that there may be little bleeding initially because part of the body's natural response to that level of trauma is to constrict the blood vessels. Once the body starts to decompensate and it relaxes the constriction on those vessels, then it's going to dump massive amounts of blood. So if you've gotten to that casualty before they're started to bleed, that's actually a good thing. Immediately put a, a tourniquet on. We'll discuss the tactile skills for applying tourniquets here in a second. All right, so A is for alert authorities to get the ball rolling, to get first responders on scene. B is to identify that major source of bleeding. We discussed what that would look like. Before we move on to the C, I also want to throw a caveat out there. Do not remove clothing from the victim just yet. We won't discuss that as part of the Stop the Bleed, but in a future session, we will discuss the March algorithm for traumatic casualties. We don't want to initiate hypothermia in that casualty by removing all their clothes. Once EMTs are on scene, they may take the trauma shears and cut everything away so they can do their primary and secondary surveys, but they also have a means of keeping that casualty's body temp high enough so they don't go into hypothermia. You may or may not. When we lose massive amounts of blood, we tend to lose core temp, which reduces the clotting ability of the blood, which leads to a cascading effect of more blood loss. So that's why we want to avoid overexposing the casualties wounds. Just open it up enough so you can visualize what you're working with. Nothing more than that. All right, moving on to the C and the ABCs according to the Stop the Bleed Coalition. C is for applying compression. There's three ways that the Stop the Bleed program teaches to apply compression to stop that massive hemorrhage. If you do not have a trauma aid kit handy, then the majority of what you're going to be able to do is just direct pressure onto the wound to help slow down the blood loss. By applying direct pressure to certain pressure points, you may actually be able to slow down or stop the wound and allow it to clot. So for those times that you do have a trauma bag available, we're going to discuss when and how to apply a tourniquet versus when and how to apply wound packing. Tourniquets are only good for extremities, meaning the arms or the legs. For tourniquet application, we want to have two or three inches above that injury where we apply that tourniquet to. The reason we want to go two to three inches above the wound is because if that vessel has been completely severed, it may retract up inside the body. And if we put that tourniquet too low, then we in effect are not actually occluding that vessel and stopping the blood flow. The other reason we want to apply that tourniquet two to three inches above the wound is because for penetrating trauma, we may not be able to adequately visualize the wound track and it may be actually a little bit higher up on the inside than what we think. So generally going two to three inches above the wound, that is where we want to apply that tourniquet. We also never ever apply a tourniquet to the joint. So we don't put it directly on the wrist, the elbow, the ankle, or the knee. It needs to be two to three inches above or two to three inches below any joint and always two to three inches above where that wound is at. 
if you don't have a tourniquet or if we've run out of tourniquets or if the location of that penetrating trauma is not on an extremity, then we're going to use wound packing. This is where we use some type of material, the cleanest material that's available, and we actually are going to pack it inside the casualty's wound. The intent is we're going to put pressure on that vessel and that direct pressure on the inside of the wound is what is going to slow down or stop the bleeding. So next up, let's discuss the actual physical techniques for applying direct pressure, for applying a tourniquet, and for packing a wound. So the first skill we're going to discuss is applying direct pressure. Now, of note on this trainer here, there's also a compound fracture. The wound is open, the bone is broken, and you see the ends of the bone sticking out. So if the case is you have exposed bone ends, you don't want that to cut into your hand and then expose you to whatever the casualty's blood-borne pathogens may be, then it would be advised to use some type of cloth, such as a folded or rolled up t-shirt, and apply the direct pressure through the t-shirt to the wound. Now understand if there's bone involvement, then that's going to cause some excruciating pain likely on a casualty who is still conscious. You are going to maintain that pressure and just explain to the casualty the what and the why behind your actions. That way they don't pull away or you get squeamish and stop and then they bleed to death. So a quick point of clarification, what I've been describing so far is if we have a compound fracture and we have massive amounts of blood either spurting or gushing out of the wound, we must immediately get direct pressure on that wound to get that bleeding under control. The major risk to life for that casualty right now is blood loss. However, that doesn't mean that they're out of the woods because if you allow those bone ends to become contaminated with a lot of dirt and grit and stuff, that bone infection may end up killing the patient once they're in the hospital. So keep in mind, we must keep that wound clean. The other consideration is if you have minimal bleeding, meaning you have that compound fracture, a bone is sticking up out of the flesh, but there's just a little bit of blood, then do not apply forceful pressure. The concern there is if that bone has broken, but it has not severed the vessels, the vessels are still intact, by applying too much direct pressure, you may inadvertently sever the arteries or the veins that run adjacent to it, then causing massive blood loss. So if there's just a little bit of blood oozing, like capillary style bleeding, then you want to put a clean rag over it, apply a moderate amount of pressure until you can get a bandage over the wound. That bandage is going to slow down or stop the capillary bleeding, as well as protect the wound from contamination. If, however, blood is spurting actively or gushing from the wound, that is when we're going to apply that forceful direct pressure directly onto the wound to slow down or stop that bleed while that tourniquet is getting ready for use. Once the tourniquet is on, then we need to take the extra step of covering that wound with a clean dressing to prevent infection. I'll link down into the description box below some medical journal articles that talk about how severe a bone infection can be. What we don't want is for our casualty to survive that initial trauma only to die days later from a massive bone infection that can't be kept under control. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's jump back into it. So the amount of pressure that we need to apply technically speaking, needs to overmatch the pressure that's being generated by the heart pumping. If we apply more pressure than the blood pressure of the casualty, then we should effectively occlude that bleed. Also keep in mind, you'll likely be doing this while kneeling down next to the casualty. So put some body weight against that to assist in occluding that bleed. If you don't have any material handy, to pad between your hand and that broken bone, then you can attempt to apply direct pressure just a little bit proximate, so higher towards the heart from where the broken bone is, and apply that direct pressure there in an attempt to stop the bleeding. If the blood is still gushing out, then you may need to actually apply pressure right over that broken bone. Just understand that when the casualty starts thrashing about, you may end up getting a laceration on your palm. That's no good. 
So that is an example of how we would apply direct pressure to an extremity wound. If we have tourniquets available, then we're going to use those in conjunction with that direct pressure. We will initially use that direct pressure to slow down or stop the bleeding while getting the tourniquets ready. Now applying direct pressure is a pretty intuitive lizard brain type task. Whenever we hurt ourselves, it's natural for us to apply pressure to where that pain or that injury is at. However, if you're having a little bit of cognitive fog and you're not able to clearly articulate what you want bystanders to do, you may be applying that direct pressure yourself initially until you can rope somebody in, have them put on a pair of gloves, and then apply that direct pressure for you, making sure they understand that it does not get released until you have a tourniquet ready to employ. Now, as far as tourniquets go, the two that I'm going to demonstrate today for you is going to be the CAT tourniquet from North American Rescue and the Soft T Wide from TacMed Solutions. Whatever tourniquet you are using, make sure that it is on the approved list of tourniquets from the Committee of Tactical Combat Casualty Care. So rather than use the actual tourniquet that I may need to use someday to save someone's life, I'm going to use a blue trainer. This blue trainer is in fact a cat tourniquet. There's nothing different between its construction and design. The only difference is it is in the color blue to identify that it's used for training, which means I can use this over and over again. If the Velcro gets wore out, if the nylon gets stretched, it's not going to be a catastrophe because this one will never be used on an actual casualty unless things get really, really sideways. So you'll note that on the cat tourniquet, there's a red tip on the end of the nylon. You want that red tip to be facing towards you so that when you go to pull on the strap to tighten it initially, you have the best amount of leverage. You're pulling towards your body as opposed to pulling away from it at a weird angle. Right now, it is stowed in kind of an S-roll type fashion, and the Velcro is kind of all stuck to itself. So what you'll notice is I have that red tab facing down towards the pinky finger of the hand that's grasping the tourniquet, and I'm going to use the inertia of that windlass, that plastic rod that we twist to get that nice tight occlusion. I'm going to take and shake that downward. It's going to pull the Velcro free, opening up the loop enough so I can slide it over the casualty's hand and up the arm. Something like that. So the red tab is facing towards me. If we are using a rag or something to apply that direct pressure, at this point you want to get it out of the way because you do not want to have this material caught underneath the strap. If this material is underneath the strap, you will not get proper occlusion. You may have blood begin to spurt again, so you're going to apply that direct pressure with your other gloved hand, slide the tourniquet up the casualty's arm, at least getting it two to three inches above the wound. You can slide it all the way up to the armpit and apply the tourniquet just above the bicep. That is referred to as putting it high and tight. Since this training arm stops at the elbow. I'm going to put this simulated two to three inches above the wound, but two to three inches below the elbow. Once we've gotten the tourniquet slid up, we're going to grab that red tab. We're going to pull this loose so that it slides. We're going to grasp that Velcro strap down near the buckle. We're going to give it a good tug directly away from the body and then we're going to pull it towards our body to get that strap nice and tight. We want to get it as tight as we can initially so it takes as few turns as possible to occlude that bleed. We want to get this Velcro all the way around but stop short of where that C-clamp buckle is. We'll get to that in a second. Now if you got that tourniquet tight enough initially when you pulled up and then towards your body and velcroed it down onto itself, you should only be able to get one or two turns of that windlass before you can't take it any further. Here I'm going to get about a half a turn and I'm going to take it all the way to that full turn and I'm going to allow it to go into the clip right here. So we're going to continue to turn that windlass until the bleeding has stopped. Once you have it to where there is absolutely no blood flow Below that on that extremity, we're going to take the tail that's remaining and we're going to give it a half twist to get it through that little clip. 
We're going to pull it on through and then we're going to lock things into place with the little Velcro tab that has the word time written on it. So if you're doing this for a skills test, you're going to want to actually write the time that you applied that tourniquet. If you're on the phone with 911 still, you can look at your watch or your phone and say, I have just applied a tourniquet at this time. The importance of knowing the time that that tourniquet was applied is because once they get to triage at the hospital, then the emergency department knows how long they have before they have to get blood flowing back to that extremity. There has been zero documented cases where anybody has lost a limb if the tourniquet was in place for up to two hours. That is going on the assumption that that limb was salvageable in the first place. Once that tourniquet has been applied, we're not going to loosen it. We have to monitor the casualty because if it's uncomfortable and they start to squirm around, or if you have to drag or move them, then this here may shift a little bit. So we want to reassess every time we move the casualty and make sure somebody stays with the casualty so they don't start monkeying with the Velcro and loosening it up. If they loosen the Velcro because it's uncomfortable, then they're going to lose that occlusion and begin to bleed out yet again. We don't want that. They may not be in the right mental state, so make sure somebody stays with the casualty whenever possible when there's a tourniquet applied. If once the tourniquet is applied, you notice the bleeding has resumed, you do not take this tourniquet off. You apply a second tourniquet, preferably above, meaning closer to the heart, above this one here. We want to have those two tourniquets adjacent to each other so that we don't have a bit of a gap in there that will cause what's called compartment syndrome. That could actually cause damage to the tissue that underlies that. Acidosis builds up, and then when those are removed, there's even more complications for that casualty. So if you must apply a second tourniquet, try to get it above. If you can't go any higher, then put it below the tourniquet you just put on and try to get them snugged up as adjacent to each other as possible. All right, so I'm going to reset and I'm going to demonstrate using the soft T wide from TACMED Solutions. So the soft T wide is applied much in the same fashion as a cat tourniquet is. However, note that there is no Velcro on the soft T wide. It makes it a little bit more robust and less likely to come loose when you're dragging or moving casualties. Other than that, they're about the same. It comes with some ultraviolet resistant rubber bands. That is how we keep it S rolled and nice and compact. When you get ready to employ it, rather than shaking it like a Polaroid picture like you do the cat tourniquet, we're going to grab one of those loops at the end here and we're going to just pull on it and that will pop the rubber bands free. Now this one does not have a red indicator tab at the bottom of it, but in much the same fashion, when we're taking and maintaining direct pressure on that wound, we're going to slide it up the extremity. When we get it two to three inches above the wound, we're going to pull towards us using that friction buckle in kind of a ratcheting fashion. And then once we get it nice and tight, as tight as we can get it, then we're going to begin turning the windlass. Now, there are two variations of the soft T wide. On this version of the soft T wide, there is no C clamp as you have on the cat tourniquet, but it does have a little triangle. And once we get that windlass to where it's as tight as we can get it and we have occluded the bleeding, we're going to take and lift that triangle up, and that's what's going to lock the windlass into place. Now I'm a huge fan of the soft T wide because it's a pretty robust tourniquet and it won't come loose quite as easy as the cat will, especially when we're moving casualties around. But the downside of the older version of the soft T wide is that it doesn't have that little C clip that you can easily put the windlass into if you're applying it to yourself with one hand. The updated version of the soft T wide. It does have a clip like that. The version I'm using right here doesn't. So that is how we would apply the soft T wide to an extremity. Now remember that tourniquets are only used on extremities. So on the arm or the leg, we're going to pat down the casualty to make sure there's nothing in their pockets because that will prevent it from occluding properly and we won't get that uh, occlusion of the blood flow that we're looking for. Next, let's talk about wound packing. So remember that we can only use tourniquets on extremities, only on the arms and the legs. If it's a junctional area, such as the side of the neck, 
the front or the pocket of the shoulder, the armpit, or the groin, we still have to stop that massive hemorrhage, but we're going to do that by applying direct pressure inside of the actual wound. Now, this is going to hurt quite a bit if that casualty is still conscious. Remember, you have a task at hand. You're going to save their life by applying direct pressure directly against that bleed. Now, there's a lot of different materials we can use to actually pack inside the wound. Ideally, we're using some type of hemostatic gauze so that it actually begins the clotting quicker than just manual pressure. We do not have to use hemostatic agent, but it will speed up the clotting of the blood. If we're using a hemostatic agent like Quick Clot or Cellox, then we only need to apply about three minutes of direct pressure to the wound in order for that clotting ability to begin. If we're using normal gauze or if we have run out of gauze or don't have access to an aid bag, we can use that clean t-shirt and get the same effect as packing the wound. If we're not using a hemostatic gauze, then we're going to maintain between eight and 10 minutes of direct pressure on that wound to allow it time to begin the clot. Keep in mind that if somebody's on blood thinners, then quick clot will not do any better or any worse than just regular old gauze. You're gonna to wanna to use Cellox. And the reason we wanna use Cellox instead of quick clot on somebody who's on a blood thinner is because the Cellox does not rely on the human's natural clotting ability of the blood. It does it independent of the body's normal mechanisms. In the end, you do not have to have some type of hemostatic agent. It will just begin the clotting factor a bit quicker than just using direct pressure with normal gauze. Also keep in mind that you don't have to use gauze if you've already run through all your gauze or you don't have an aid bag available. You can use any type of clean material to pack into that wound. All right, so now let's discuss the techniques for actually packing a wound. So for this demonstration, I'll be using a training packet of quick clot. When we pull it out, it just looks like normal S-rolled gauze, but it has a blue little strip in there. It shows up as opaque on x-rays. That way, when they get to the ER and they do an image of the body, they'll realize, uh-oh, there is some gauze packed into this wound if they don't already see it when they begin to explore it. So ideally we want to leave that gauze as best we can inside the package so it's not dragging in the dirt or on the ground. Pull out just enough for you to use. If you have pulled it all the way out and you're too befuddled to shove it back in, then you could take and shove it down your shirt or something like that and then just pull out as much as you need. We're going to initially only pull out this much and we'll do what's called a power ball where we're going to wad up a bit of material into a very nice firm tight ball at the end of it and this is what we're going to put on our fingertip initially if there's any jellied blood that is kind of lingering at the top of the wound you may want to wipe that away what i don't want you to do is to dig and do exploratory surgery because you may actually blow a clot if one has already started to form on its own if it still has bright blood spurting out or it's oozing out quickly then by all means get some fingers in there pull that stuff out the best you can so you can visualize and see what you're doing we want to apply that pressure of this power ball, that, that tight wad at your fingertip, directly against the severed vessel. Where the source of the bleeding is, is where we want to apply that direct pressure. So once you're able to visualize what you're doing, if you see where the actual severed vessel is, where the blood is bubbling or spurting out from, you wanna take that power ball that's at the end of your fingertip and we're going to place it directly against the severed or bleeding vessel. That direct pressure inside the wound channel is what is going to stop the bleeding. Remember, we're not just packing it in there loosely to sop up the blood. We actually want to apply direct pressure inside the wound. Depending on the size of that wound channel, you may need to take your other hand and continue to feed material in to the wound. And we're going to take and swap finger for finger only for a fraction of a second, giving up that direct pressure. We're going to continue pushing that gauze in, getting it nice and tightly packed down into the wound. And we're going to continue that action until that entire wound channel has been filled with gauze. Now, once that wound is completely full of gauze, we're gonna continue with that mounding up because remember your casualties tissue is a bit elastic 
And once you have them all packaged up and the EMT is getting ready to transport that casualty, things that are inside might shift around. The muscle and the tissue may shift a bit and then it may not be retaining that pressure. So once we have that big mound of gauze, we can't pack anymore and it's nice and tight, then we continue to apply that direct pressure. If we're using a hemostatic gauze, the standard is at least three minutes of direct pressure on that wound. If it is Cellox Rapid, then you can get away with one minute because it works a little bit faster. If we're using regular gauze that does not have a hemostatic agent or if we're using that clean rag or shirt to pack into the wound, it's the same principle, except now we're going to be applying direct pressure for eight to 10 minutes to give that clot time to form. Once we've applied the direct pressure for the prescribed amount of time based off of whatever material we're using to pack the wound, then we need to wrap that with some type of a elastic bandage to keep it all nice and tight in place. If we're gonna use something such as this self-adhesive wrap, then we wanna make sure that as we're preparing it and putting it in our trauma bag, that we go ahead and dog ear and kind of wrap onto itself that working edge to make it easier for us to get a hold of when we're actually using it for real. You don't wanna to have to use your glove fingertips to try to peel stuff free. We're going to get enough open so that we can transfer that wad underneath our control hand and then we're going to snugly wrap that making sure that we get that as tight as we can. Remember we don't want that wad to bust loose. We want that direct pressure to be maintained all the time once we take our hand completely off. Once we've got that nice and firm, we can take and rip that off, check our work, make sure it stays nice and tight, and then go ahead and dog ear and prepare that for your next application in case you're fixing to bounce over to the next casualty. That is wound packing. So that wraps up the ABCs of the Stop the Bleed program. Remember the first thing we're always gonna do, that first priority work is security. We're going to assess the scene, is things safe? Whatever the source of injury was, is it no longer present? We're also going to put on whatever body substance isolation or personal protective equipment that we need. I will caveat that with it. If it's a child or a loved one, I'm not going to worry about putting on gloves before rendering aid because their life is more important than my own. If it's an unknown person, and especially somebody who at appearances has an at-risk lifestyle and they may have bloodborne pathogens, then I may take a pregnant pause, put on some gloves before rendering aid. After we've sized up the scene and we put on any personal protective gear, then we're going to go to A, alert the authorities. We're gonna get that ball rolling so that first responders show up as quickly as possible. When we make that phone call or our proxy makes that phone call for us because we directed somebody to do that, we wanna make sure that they have our specific location of where we're at, our name, our callback number in case things get wonky and we get disconnected, and then describe the number of casualties and the type of injuries that they have. That's the review for A, for alert. B, we're gonna identify major sources of bleeding. Namely, if anything is spurting out of the wound, if there is blood-soaked clothing that is continuing to pool or puddle up on the ground, or if there is a traumatic amputation, we're immediately going to apply a tourniquet to those. If a tourniquet is not available, then direct pressure, not on the stump, but on pressure points above where the stump is. And then we go to C. C is for applying compression. We're going to apply direct pressure. If we have tourniquets and gauze or any other clean material available, then we will move on to applying a tourniquet if it's on an extremity. If it's not on an extremity and it's on a junctional area, such as the side of the neck, the pocket of the shoulder, the armpit, or the crease of the groin, then we're going to pack the wound with either gauze or some clean material until we get it nice and mounded up. And we'll continue that direct pressure until we have stopped the bleeding and or until we pass that casualty off into the hands of first responders. Hope this video was helpful, but keep in mind that lecture is not the way to learn these skills. You must do these hands-on. So find yourself a Stop the Bleed instructor, especially during the month of May because it's Stop the Bleed month. If you're interested in hands-on training, then hit that bleedingcontrol.org link that's down in the description block and find a live class somewhere near you. If you're in the Central Texas region, my link is down below. Hit that and we can set up a private session for your family, your church group, your community center, whatever you're involved in. Until next time, 
God bless you and stay safe. There are certain parts of the body that you will not be able to put a tourniquet on, such as the side of the neck. Technically, I guess you could put a tourniquet around the neck, but that's going to occlude the blood flow to the brain, and then that's terrible. Don't do stupid stuff. Think through it.